happens and uh, people will appear and spinners will spin. <laughs> uh, it says so we're live. It says we're live. That might actually be true. Uh, hello to those <laughs> of you out there in the, the wide world. Uh, while people are joining, uh, I'll say hello first from me and Howell. I'll introduce Howell properly in a second. Uh, if you want to know where you are and if you're at the right place, this is the uh, um, live stream from the Squirrel Squadron on um, uh, eliminating your training budget. So how to make sure that you uh, uh, get all the right skills in your tech team without spending a minute on training or a, a, a penny on it. So uh, if you wanted to talk about that, you're in the right place. Get your questions ready because uh, these are always much, much better when there are questions. So uh, we want to see those in the chat. And if you don't have questions, it'll be shorter, but um, uh, we'll still have fun. But uh, we'd much rather prefer, much rather answer your questions. Um, uh, if you're watching this on a recording, of course, you can't ask us questions here. Uh, but the Squirrel Squadron is my community of uh, uh, tech and non-tech people learning together. Uh, I don't know of any community anywhere that has that mix of um, uh, tech and non-tech. There's lots for each, but. Now, where do they come together? Well, they come together in my community, the Squirrel Squadron, and uh, you can ask your questions on the Squirrel Squadron forum. You can drop me an email. Um, you can get in touch with us at uh, squirrelsquadron.com, and uh, you'll find all that information. Uh, we do these events uh, every week. So uh, next week, I'm at the Pi Data Global Conference. So if you're interested in talking about data science and uh, how to get your, your data scientists working well, uh, Howell, I bet you've trained some data scientists, so we can talk about that. So uh, if you're interested, that's next week at a slightly different time. Uh, after that, we have uh, Grumbles into Gold, uh, how to uh, get psychological safety, make your team successful because they're complaining. Uh, and then in uh, January on the 12th, I'm in London in person, so you can come see me uh, live uh, for real. And we're going to talk then about uh, um, uh, letting the robots do it. How do you get your operations to be as efficient as possible? Actually use tech to make some profit. What a crazy idea. So uh, come along to any of those that are interesting. Uh, ask us questions here. Uh, go ahead and start putting those in the chat. So um, uh, we're interested. We want to hear them. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce Howell. Uh, Howell's an old friend of mine. Uh, Howell, we started together, I must have been five years ago now, maybe maybe four or five. I can't remember. I think um, possibly more than that. But do you remember maybe. we met even before before Bridge U, which was the company where oh. we first met, when a previous startup of mine, we reached out to you for advice. When I used um, to do the breakfast with Squirrel, when I used to do the, the or come have lunch with me and chat uh, about your startup. I remember, yes. Fantastic. Yeah, so a long time ago. That was... Oh, gosh, like 2010 or 2011? Something like that. Yeah, well, I was just learning how to give people advice. I hope I gave you good advice. I, I may not have done. I was. I, was I, I think you did, yeah. So okay. we, well, maybe okay. you didn't learn anything from us. I don't know. Well, because, I'm uh... sure I, I always learn every time I talk to Howell. Uh, we worked <laughs> together at a company called BridgeU, where um, I consulted and Howell was CTO. Uh, and uh, Howell has since moved on from BridgeU and uh, doing all kinds of interesting things. But the one he's going to talk about today is called Skiller Whale. And uh, that's a fantastic organization that um, helps or helps companies uh, learn very, very quickly. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is how can you help your engineers to learn really fast without some of the crazy things that people do? Hal, did you want to give a really brief intro to Skill or Whale? Tell us a bit about what it is, where it came from, what it does. Uh, absolutely. So it came from my experiences as an undergrad, which I think is one of the few times in my life I've experienced very good learning. So I was a, a student at Cambridge and I think Cambridge has an excellent system for learning. And I didn't see that anywhere else in the world. And so I wanted to make it exist in the world because of problems I had felt as as a CTO, as, as a coach running a dinner club for CTOs and seeing that there were constant problems with skill gaps. And the, the only thing we can turn to to solve them is hiring. And I don't know about you, but I avoid hiring whenever possible. I don't like extra cost if I can avoid it. I don't like spending all of the time on hiring. I don't like um, the, the the slow ramp up. So for me, hiring should be the last option. Um, but sometimes it feels like it's the only option. And well, so let's the, start the approach there, between... actually. Oh, go on. Yeah. Oh, I was just... If you have go more, go it. ahead. Well, the, the approach we take at Skill well is what we call deep coaching. So it's coaching that is diagnostic. And so we first will work out where individual gaps are and which gaps matter and only train the gaps that matter to the people who need to know that thing. It's experiential and you learn a lot better by doing. Uh, there's good evidence that constructive learning gets much better learning outcomes than just kind of absorbing information. 
it's expert led um, to learn a skill you need to try and fail and have the opportunity to try again um, you you were talking about um, helping us with advice back in the past and I think if there was no failure for you in that it's unlikely that you could have learned and improved, improved I from. failed a lot let me tell you <laughs> well I, maybe not with us though um, and it's problem based so it's it's about solving realistic problems so that when you come out of learning you want to go and apply that thing it suddenly feels easy because you've already solved problems with it it's not like you've just been given the theory uh, on some you know in, in, a, in a book or via a video that you then got to go and try and work it out a bit into practice that's happened so you come out skilled not just aware or with your horizons broadened nice and so that's that's how we work over to you scroll sorry fantastic no I, I i'm gonna start at a different place now because you've just given given us so much interesting material um lots of folks watch us from around the world and they may not know very much about cambridge uh, I was in the running to come and study at Cambridge at one point, but I didn't win. So uh, that's a failure, which was fine. Uh, lots of other good things happened to me too. But um, so I never got to see this. What, what's the, the kind of origin story here? What, what's the system at Cambridge that you found interesting that you, you're um, you drawing from here? Yeah, so Cambridge, I studied engineering at Cambridge. So I went to lectures with 300 people learning about something, mainly data science actually was, was my focus in the end as an undergrad. And then you get given um, like problem sheets, basically, that are based on the material from the lectures, but go beyond it. And you try and solve those on your own. If you if, actually, whether or not you solve them, you then go to these small group classes with not a professor, but like a master's student, someone who is expert relative to you, who then helps you with the stuff that you didn't get right, helps you understand the things that didn't come across in the lectures, looks at the work you've done and says, oh, I see why you thought this, but actually it works like that. Here's how you apply that, that information. And for me, that's where all the learning happened um, is in those smaller group sessions, because it's not just, it's not enough to try and solve the problems. You need to have your mistakes, your shortcomings identified and helped to, you need to be helped to overcome them. Um, and so it was that model, which for me was, I think we had two or three of those each week um, throughout term time as, as a student. And that was where all of the learning happened. And actually I, I just don't see that existing for most people in the workplace. I think it does exist, but it's very hard to come by and generally very expensive. Um, and so yeah. I and, want to make we'll that widely into, available. We'll get into what people try to do to replicate that. I, I will say that there was actually a fairly similar system. I thought you might've said something different. That's the mm. system that we used at Berkeley, but it didn't work. Um, and I was a graduate student there. And uh, so I was teaching calculus in those little groups and uh, I was very unusual among the graduate students in paying any attention at all to the people that I was teaching. And I really had a blast doing it. Uh, I thought that was fun. Um, but most of them uh, viewed it as a, a chore, not something uh, sort of a labor of love. Um, so mm. uh, I, I think the, the attitude to it and making it successful is, is maybe what was different because it was certainly a, a sausage factor at Berkeley that did not, did not work right. very well for the students. Uh, whereas you're describing oh, much, so a much more powerful experience. I mean, I definitely had less engaged uh, enga engaged tutors. I remember one very vividly, um, a, R a Russian guy who would throw down a piece of paper in front of us and give us no time to read it and just shout, who is X? And I, I can't say I learned an awful lot from his approach, but every time I asked a question, he was overflowing with, with enthusiasm to answer it. And so it put the onus more on us as learners to sort of say, I, I'm not interested in who X is. I, I, want, I want your help in this question from, from my lectures. Um, but then he was like, oh yeah, you know, full of, full of energy to explain it. Um, and so maybe Fantastic. it's, maybe it's, yeah, you need either the, the, the people taking the session to be uh, very diligent or you need learners who are going to bring the, the the coach back to the straight and narrow if they're mine was going. business calculus and i had it was taught at eight o'clock in the morning so um this this was Ooh. not energetic learners or necessarily energetic me but let's let's get uh, on to to engineers because mm. one of the solutions people try for this they say look my engineers don't know everything that they need to know this is a pretty standard thing because the world is changing so quickly especially in technology and people say well that's not a problem i'll just hire more What's wrong with that? Why not just hire people who have the skills that you need? So ultimately, that if that commercially makes sense for you, then I think go for it. I would say that strategy is the reason why we're seeing so many layoffs at the moment. Like growth has been tied to headcount. Doing more has been tied to having more people. 
Um, and it and is being generally... more successful has been tied to doing more. This is why I always talk about activity metrics versus outcome metrics. And there's an mm. awful lot of activity at Twitter, but it seems like since Twitter is still running, a lot of it was activity that didn't produce tweets. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I got the same sense at uh, Apple and, and Facebook and the others with layoffs. Um, so you're suggesting that uh, if I have skills that are lacking and I hire people, I may just get more people and more activity, but I might not get results. Did I hear that right? You might get you might get results. You might get the skills that you want into your team, but you've done it in an inefficient way. That means that when when times get harder, when markets get tighter, when you start having to care more about profit and less about revenue, you regret those hires and have to lay them off. A much nicer alternative is if you're able to take the people you have and make them into the people that you wish you had had rather than hiring to fill in those gaps, which then has the side bonus of um, improving retention. Um, so the, the stats are that the, the average uh, software developer will leave their job with a probability of 57% in a given year. That's the average across. Mm -hmm. And that's including, you know, the kind of startups and scale ups that I think you're used to working with, where generally people are going to be quite engaged. But it, we're also including in that massive, massive corporates and sort of faceless enterprise institutions. The best in class achieve more like 13% a year. So that's the difference between roughly one in two to more like one in eight or something. It's a, a huge improvement in retention. And part of that comes from investing in your people, giving them the opportunity to not just grow new skills, but to say, we need someone who's a principal engineer in this area. And we would like you to grow into that, not we're going to hire someone in to be that. Got it. And so one of the great ways to do that, well, it's not that great, but uh, a way that people think is great is that uh, you, you create a lot of perks and you say, look, we're going to bribe people to stick around. We want to get into that uh, 13%. We want to be at that end of the, the market because we're going to train our people. So one thing we'll do is we'll make sure that they have hackathons and we're going to give them um, fun opportunities to go and learn uh, new things that are irrelevant to our business. But, but that's okay because you need to bribe the engineers, you see. And, and uh, <laughs> another way to bribe them is to send them to a lot of conferences so they can learn the stuff that's exciting to them. Now, I'm uh, describing this in the way it's often described to me, and my reaction is balderdash, usually. I, mm. I wonder what your reaction is. My reaction is those, those are all nice things to have. I don't know mm. whether they have the intended consequence. So I, I, think, uh, I think conferences are an amazing place for building networks, um, which if people want to get a new job is, is perhaps not what you want as their, their manager. Yes. Um, and I think all of those perks are are nice things, but ultimately this comes down to uh, extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. If it's if there's something you can give me that I can buy, you've essentially given me money in in one yeah. form. I've bribed or another. you, right? Bribes are one way to get people to stay. In. And and if you give an, an unhappy employee more money, then you have a richer unhappy employee. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you haven't solved your problem. No, although you you might have funded someone's new kitchen. I think um I, I think that. You know, there's good research on intrinsic motivation, right? Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, it's the kind of standard, I forget the name of the TED Talk, of the, the person who delivers it. But it's, it's well known enough that if you search for autonomy, mastery, and purpose, you'll 100% find it on the, the first page. Um, and in knowledge-focused professions, the, the evidence is that we motivate people that way. In more, in more kind of rote work or manual work, then money can be a sufficient motivator. But that isn't the case in software development. And we're, it's we're not generally point... laying bricks in software. We aren't doing something that people have done before that's fungible that others can do. We're doing something that's very specialized, has never been done before. And motivating people with money to type faster usually produces more typing and not more uh, 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 output. Yes, at some point, I must tell you the story about the team that was uh, was given money for every um, bug they would fix in the two weeks running up to a big release. Oh, fantastic! Um, Wait, no, tell us that story. You can't, you can't dangle that one. Tell us. <laughs> well, I feel like the punchline is kind of obvious now. the 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 team it's a it's a very very well known big software company, one of the big six, um, and they were coming up to a very big crunch release of one of their um, flagship products. And they wanted to iron out all of the bugs. And so they said to their development team, we will pay you for every bug that you fix. Um, 
And this would is, you believe this is not that... going to be a, a happy ending? This is not this is not a comedy <laughs> that we're that we're about to hear. Okay, keep going, Hal. I I think it's a happy ending if you are the bank manager of the employees. Yes, and if you yes, are the... <laughs> that's good. If you're selling Teslas, you're probably in good shape. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> if you if you are the leader or the management or the CFO in that company, it's, it doesn't end doesn't end well for you because obviously obviously there were bugs being found and resolved within an hour because you know this pixel pixel difference here this typo here which previously you'd have just fixed now was a bug that had to be raised and and resolved and it entirely encouraged all of the wrong behaviors maybe some of the real bugs got fixed but that wasn't the incentivized behavior the incentivized behavior was to add some code accidentally include a bug uh, and then go and, and fix it and there were stories about you know testers teaming up with developers to kind of you find it, I'll fix it. And... yeah I'll keep going exactly but hang on right. so so there's there's other ways of producing um improved um engineering skills or at least people think so and and one of them is okay. I'm not going to hire. I am going to improve my team's skills, and and I'm not going to um, just send them off to conferences. What I'll do is I'll get them together within my organization. Uh, I'll call it a guild, and then what I'll have is my kind of front end guild and my back end guild, and I'll follow the Spotify model because it's working out so well for Spotify. Not by the way, um, <laughs> and uh, I'll have these guilds who will get together periodically, and they'll generate their own work. So um, uh, we won't have rewards for, for fixing bugs, but we will have this kind of generator of extra um, additional tasks. And uh, the product managers are going to love that, aren't they? Uh, th they aren't. <laughs> yes. I think you know That's that. <laughs> unfortunately, the end of that. So I'm just putting I in always... my sarcastic voice today. Yeah. The, the I always find the Spotify model so weird, the sort of like mixture of quite... Um, sort of militaristic and like monastery kind of um, high church kind of terminology. Yeah, um, you imagine like... the, the backend developers going up in the tower somewhere and, and inventing their, their rituals. And like everyone's wearing a cloak to cover their face because they're in the backend <laughs> guild. I, I don't know. Um, so I think, so I think communities of practice are useful. I think they are. I think generating work from them feels like a bad idea. Um, and I think even if if you have a community of like I think work should be about commercial results, and I I suspect you fully agree with that. I think it should be about I, what I'm is actually strong, useful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought you might. Um, mm -hmm. And I think generating work because it because it's come out of a community of practice is not a good idea. I think having on the other hand, practice, it's great mm. if your front end developers say, "Here's a thing we could do, and here's its commercial benefit," and product managers and customers and people like that take that as input. That's great. It's when it's a, a non-optional output. <laughs> you will do this because the guild says so. Sorry, we can't get the feature done because we're working on something the backend team thought up. That's when you mm. get into real trouble on the profitability, which is what I am always talking about. How can you make your team profitable? And the problem with this is it creates this kind of guild atmosphere. We're kind of moving up in, in effectiveness, right? Hiring produced um, just happier, uh, 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 richer, unhappy employees. Sending them to conferences got them a better network. They may get another job. They might learn something, but you don't know. Community of practice, having this guild, is going to actually produce some interesting outputs. It's going to produce some, some knowledge and some things that are relevant to you. But um, it's kind of got the the, um, the 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 order wrong. It's kind of got the cart before the horse, where you're producing the work before you um, uh, prioritize it, decide whether it's the right thing. How do you see that hierarchy? I, I think if that's what your community of practice is doing, that seems really, as you said, cart before horse to me. Because I think the whole reason we have a product function is to 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 link the work of of developers and the people who build to what is required. And if things are being built bypassing that system, uh, you're effectively saying that you know better than the people whose whole job that is. And maybe you do, but like you should at least <laughs> consult them first. Maybe your thing really is the most valuable, but like that's their that's their call to make, in my opinion. Um, and, and the danger well, is that those those communities of practice, which are great when they work well, by the way. So I have no objection to the front end people getting together to generate great mm. ideas. It's when they are, then get to decide what to do, and they often get focused on the best practice, which is a phrase I don't let anyone use in my presence. You, you don't say that twice near me, because they'll describe something that's best for Spotify or Apple or mm -hmm. um, uh, Twitter. It's not best for your situation, and that's where you need the local knowledge. That's where you need people like product managers, customer representatives, folks like that, 
who, who say, well, actually, that has some benefit for those guys, but we're not scaling in that way. We're not driving to that market. We're not going to internationalize. So you know, adding this is of no, little or no benefit. Can we focus on this more boring, not necessarily as exciting and CV friendly, but really, really useful and profitable item over here? And when you don't give them the option to do that, which the Spotify model, as it's often misused, leads to, you get into a lot of trouble. I, w I would actually go further. I think a best practice can be within Twitter, like the advertising interface of Twitter, the best practice there might be different to the consumer facing side Absolutely. of the company. It's Absolutely. Con you I know, meant in, you, inside I, your organization, which may be a sub organization. Yeah. Right. And I think um, so you've been a, a guest on the primarily context-based podcast before. So, you know, that I was going like to let you talk about that later. Don't let me forget. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> So context is critical has become a sort of a catchphrase of mine, I think, because it's part of my standard intro there. And I think this is one of the problems with communities of practice that can come up is that they are excitement driven. They are the thing that gets talked about is the thing that I'm excited about, which might not be the thing that you actually need to learn. Yeah. There might be things that none of, none of us know that, you know, even the most senior people in the company, everyone has something to learn. And it's entirely possible that there is a, a, a gap, a sort of absent skill from everyone who's involved. And whether or not it becomes a, a best practice, whether it becomes adopted, really is about how much I communicate that excitement to you. And so I think those things are great. They're a form of broadening horizons, expanding what you're aware of, adding more tools to the, your, your belt. The idea of that dictating the next ticket that, or even writing the next ticket that you go and work on seems bogus. Yeah, that's where you really get into trouble. So to summarize this, I'll give an example of a team that really did it well at a company called Arachnus. It was uh, one of my mm. uh, early clients. And uh, what they would do is every week they got pizza and they would get uh, the whole engineering team together and they would watch videos from the outside. Um, uh, they did uh, the clean code series. They did um, mm -hmm. katas. They did a bunch of different things. And they were trying to bring in new ideas, things they hadn't thought of. And this was great because then they would say, all right, well, the, the business oriented feature, the thing I'm trying to do, the thing that's been prioritized looks like this. And hey, I just learned this thing over here and I can plug that in. And that mm. was super helpful. And, and that leads me to my, my next question. We, we've kind of had an implicit assumption here, you and me, Howell. I think it's because we share it, but uh, viewers and listeners may, may, may not share it, may not know what we're using. What are we using to measure? So when we want to say, is this effective? We said, hey, hiring, uh, if you can do it, um, it might, might work. Um, uh, paying people more really doesn't help you. What, what's the measurement? How do you say this training was effective? Because the title of this is eliminate your training budget. So we better have something that's not training, not this, these kind of traditional things we've been bashing for a while. And we better have a way to measure whether it's effective. So how, how mm. would you say, say one of your customers uh, would look back and say, I spent all this money with Howell and I got skill or whale in and what? So I think measures are ultimately outcome based and they are different situationally so one of the things about learning is it can enable a variety of different skills uh, different outcomes so if what you're learning is intended to make you write better code uh, write more kind of future-proof code maybe or to uh, write code that performs better and, and runs faster there are measures you can hang on each of those things and some of them might be kind of a feeling right if, if people in the the uh, team are noticing, actually our, our pull requests are spending less time sort of in the doldrums and we're getting them shipped faster and we haven't lowered our standards. The thing that might have changed is that the quality of the code going in is considered higher. And that's that's not a directly commercial outcome, but it leads to a faster team, which then is a commercial outcome. Sometimes it's about performance. It's about, um, you know, the code in our database now runs faster. Our queries are running uh, three milliseconds faster across the board. And for us, because we're an API company, that's extremely significant. And we can point to our measurements for that. And so there's this interesting thing about learning. I, I think it's always two degrees of two degrees of separation away from revenue. We mm -hmm. want more revenue. We want to be doing better. Therefore, this thing needs to happen. And the way we're going to make that happen is learning this thing. Oh, I like that. I may steal that two, two degrees of separation. That seems really useful. Um, and uh, one of the things that you emphasized there was um, that, that these things would be visible. And, and that's what's often missing. It's missing, from exa for example, from the Spotify model example we were talking about, but it's missing in a lot of other cases too. 
if you say one we didn't talk about was hiring a training company, hey, let's have somebody come and we'll teach everybody Rust. And they'll know the new, know the new programming language Rust. We'll rewrite our software in Rust and, and then it'll be better. And the, the problem is that um, usually there's this huge separation between the time when everybody learns the new amazing thing and some kind of outcome. And it's been so long, nobody remembers that we spent all that money on training. It might be years later. Uh, I'm reminded of the uh, famous um, uh, uh, South Park episode where the gnomes are stealing underpants. Um, this doesn't make sense. You probably haven't seen South Park, so you should go watch this. But um, <laughs> there's these, there's these um, imaginary gnomes, well, they're real in the, in the story, um, who are uh, running around stealing underpants from all the characters. And the, the characters finally corner them and say, gnomes, what are you doing? Why are you stealing these underpants? And they show their business plan. And their business plan consists of um, uh, steel underpants. Um, and at the bottom is a really good outcome, profit. The problem is there's nothing in the middle. <laughs> it's all question marks. And they haven't figured out what goes in the middle. And if that middle piece, that, sec that second degree of separation, is too far away from the outcome, if it takes a long time to happen, then you're not getting the, the benefit or else you can't measure it. You don't know, was it the rest? Was it the new hires? Was it the perks we gave them? Was it that um, they learned it on their own? You don't know. And therefore, it's really hard to measure. What, what do you think about that, Howell? Is, is speed part of the, the issue? I... I think speed to implement is a general is a is a bigger problem in learning generally. So I, mm -hmm. I divide learning in, into knowledge, skills, and wisdom. Oh, okay. Knowledge, knowledge is like data; it's it's information. Um, skills is like ability, like doing things, like picking up a, a bottle of water. Right, is a skill that you you have had for a long time. I imagine. Like if I yeah. I just dropped it, you... but that's another story. Go on. <laughs> um, but if I explain to you, here are, here are the muscles that you're using. You're doing this with your fingers. You don't think about any of that. You're you're just able to do it um, naturally. And then wisdom is the kind of contextual judgment. It's knowing whether you pick the if the bottle is very full, you don't pick up from right at the bottom because you know it will topple over. You no one has to tell you that. You just in, instinctively grab it, you know, somewhere nearish the top. Um, and a lot of learning focuses on the dissemination of knowledge. It's about giving you the information and the data. So if I go and read a book, I can get a load of information. Um, if I go and, and watch a talk, I can get a load of information. And then I want to go and put that into practice. And that's when you start getting to the skill. Um, so the, another model that's useful to talk about here is different modes of learning. Passive is the sort of absorbing information. Active is inter interacting with the, um, the sort of information source, like underlining things in a book. Constructive is learning by doing. And interactive, gold standard, is when you learn by doing with other humans involved. Learning uh, information can be done purely passively. So um, people people gather information just as we as we talk. So if you if you had never known before that you should pick up a bottle by the top by the something near the top and not by the bottom, you will have gathered that information just from hearing it said. Um, to learn a skill, or by you watching have to me do it. it, or by watching you do it exactly. So you can pick up that that kind of information visually, orally, other ways exist. Um, to learn a skill, you have to do something. No matter how much of the World Cup you watch, you will not get better at football. I, I play the saxophone. I read books. I listen to people playing the saxophone. None of that makes me a better saxophonist. Um, I have to actually play the thing. Um, and wisdom comes from experience and reflection. You can get wisdom from others, but it's kind of it's harder. It's it, being able to see why that was a bad decision is something that's generally easiest in hindsight, which means our future decision making is better. So I think and a lot about the a sounding board can be very helpful. I'm often doing that for my clients that I coach is they say, was this a good idea? And I say, well, what was the result? And they say, oh, it didn't come out so well. I said, maybe you try this. That yes, sounding the, board, the, that reflection is helpful. The, the, the huge value of a sounding board is also, I saw this in this other situation or my company does this and we find that and our context is this. And then you start to see, oh, well, it makes sense that your team is working in this way because of your context and we work in this way and that's right for us because of our context and you actually grow wisdom by having those kind of um, discussions where you find out the what people are doing and then sort of why your way back to understand the the context um, but I think a lot about the cycle time of learning so when I go and read a book or watch a video and then try and put it into practice for me there's a lot of the learning that happens when I'm trying to do the thing and often you'd need to go back and refer to the learning materials to, I don't know, or like to Google and look on Stack Overflow and be like, oh, how does this thing in Rust work? Or ask a friend for help. 
And sometimes that cycle can be two weeks. If you think about a, a kind of standard, like two or three day long course on Rust, say, you at the start of that course, you might learn something that you only really get to put into practice at maybe at the end of the first day, if you're lucky, maybe a week later, if you're unlucky. And, and it won't be real practice either. It'll be like those problem sheets you had at, at Cambridge. It'll be something abstract. It won't be, how can we make use of this to make our database uh, three times faster? So that I think good questions do, will give you a database and will say, here's a query, go and make this, this faster, which if the problem is set up correctly, then will transfer over to your learning. If it's if it's kind of like here is a query, underline the bad bit. You know that's that's not that's not going to help. Or the worst one is a quiz where you're you're quizzed on the materials themselves. My goodness, I, like the the aim is not to memorize the thing that's being learned. The aim is to to put it into practice and and gain the skill. And so that's the why right I always I learning, always tell my clients don't, don't um, when you're interviewing don't ask a bunch of kind of uh, trivia questions. Well, is this the right operator? And how do you add this to that? And where, where, what's the precedence of this thing? If you ask a bunch yeah. of those kinds of questions, what you find out is whether the person can parrot the material. Uh, you have no idea whether they can apply it. Yes, exactly. And I, I, I think none of us wants software developers in our team that have memorized the, you know, the syntax of the language definition or I'd whatever. I'd much rather they Google can... that but they have the wisdom yes. to know that whatever they're Googling is a terrible idea and they better not do it. And this is it, like knowledge is cheap now. So we can just Google for knowledge or we can search a confluence instance for knowledge. Skills are actually the thing that we care most about in work. And so if you want people to get more skills, the trick is to get that cycle time as low as possible. So if you're gonna tell someone the kind of information they need to put it into practice, try and get them immediately to do that, to put to, to start honing the skill and solving problems with what they've learned, because it's then that they actually have to confront what the topic, they have to actually solve a problem with it, which is what you want them to do outside of the learning environment. And so I think, I think bad forms of learning, that looks like weeks or months or even a year potentially. I think good forms of learning, it's like 10 minutes, maybe five. Okay, so I just want to pause for a second. We've spent about a half an hour telling you all the things you shouldn't do. We're going to talk about what you should do in a minute, but I want to make sure people have a chance to ask questions. Please do throw them in the chat in whatever form you're watching us. Um, and uh, if you're watching us on the recording, put them on the Squirrel Squadron forum where there'll be a link at the end and, and should be below this video as well. Um, uh, just say hello to Jim and Adina who put some fun comments in. Um, if you guys have questions or anybody else, uh, please put them in. We'd much rather answer your questions than go through what we have. Although I'm having a blast with Howell, so they're, they're, it's never it's never bad. We're always having fun. Um, but but Howell, what should we do instead? So we we've said hiring isn't going to work. Um, uh, paying them more just makes them richer. Um, uh, um, uh, sending them to conferences or having a, a perk that that doesn't really kind of bribe them. Um, uh, and um, uh, having a, a guild has some some real pitfalls. Those are bad things. What should we do instead? How could we eliminate our training budget so we don't have to spend on all these things that actually don't work? And how could we get this deep learning, this uh, this benefit that you've described? So I think I think training is is a real like poisoned word for me. I the word training to me conjures up boredom, honestly. Like I think of training, I think for a lot of people is associated with compliance. It's associated with the sort of one to many, what's called a jug and mug model. That someone someone present has a huge amount of knowledge in their kind of jug of wisdom, and they pour a little bit into exactly. exactly. Yeah. And they pour a little bit into everyone else's um, mug, and therefore we have gained from from them. Which and that does happen. To be clear, there are real experts out there. They do give you useful knowledge. They can distill their wisdom sometimes into useful frameworks for the rest of us who aren't so wise. Um, but I think that is generally not going to be a way that any of us gain a skill. You need to do. Um, and so, I advocate strongly for an approach called deep coaching. Um, and deep coaching is about firstly being diagnostic. So one of my problems with training is it's typically organized around the idea of a course. And a course is typically organized around the idea of a preset series of things. It's kind of a, a factory model of we're going to learn this, 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 and this. And you can either enter the course and go through that production line or you can not. Um, I think that good learning 
uh, focuses on the things that are just just adjacent to what you are already able to do and pull you in the direction that you need to go in. So you diagnose people first and say, great, we've looked at what Rust you can already do. And it seems that you, you understand the idea of a variable. You understand the idea of assigning versus comparing for equality. But there are all these things that you don't understand. You don't understand. Rust has this interesting thing around um, borrowing and references. And so you don't understand how that works or really kind of grok the underlying reason why. So that's where we're going to focus on for you. Um, and so that I, for me, the diagnostic is important as well because it links individual motivation to lead a strategy. It's, it's about looking at what actually would make the difference for your team to learn about and what each person on your team needs to know and finding that intersection and only working there. Because there's, there's no point in anything else, in my opinion. Like the, the, the company should not be paying for learning that isn't in line with what's needed from the people. Broadly, I think if you want to offer that as a perk, by all means do, but I don't expect it to have any impact on you your expect top a zero line. return on investment, if not negative. Right. It might reduce churn. That is the one the one thing that you, you can get from that kind of uh, use of bribery. So I'm going to use that word bribery right. approach. But, but, but um, I often find it increases churn because people say, hey, now I know something new. Why don't I uh, say goodbye and, and go use it somewhere else? And it's also become, uh, I guess, not quite commoditized, but it's become the core of the offering, right? Almost everyone now has a thousand pounds per year L&D budget that's discretionary that you can spend on what you want. Yeah. Um, and, and that may be nice for you, but the return on investment just is completely opaque to me. And the cycle time is huge, right? It's going to be a long mm. time between when you learn whatever it is at the conference you go to and when you apply it. Whereas what you're describing is um, very person-centered. So you're focused on the outcome for that person as well as for the team. And you're tailoring what they're learning to their needs at the moment. And, and really moment by moment, what, what I, I think I understand you do, Howell, please tell me if I'm wrong, is you do a form of pairing. So you're, you're doing the task with the person as they're learning. Is that right or am I missing something? So, so once we've done that diagnostic, we then would run a session, and this is part of the deep coaching model, we would run a session on each of those topics that matter, only inviting the people that need to know that thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's small groups, so it's not one-on-one, -on -one, um, mm -hmm. but it will be like one-on-four or one-on-five, enough that people can still get individual attention. Um, and that learning is all about uh, telling you something and then having you go and do it. So it should be problem-based and experiential because you should be in in the, the kind of scenario and you should be solving problems because then you put the learning into immediate practice. You start building up that skill and then you have an expert who's there leading the session who gives you the feedback. Um, so when you get stuck, when you have a question, when your code doesn't run and they can say, ah, you left off a semicolon on line seven. That, uh, <laughs> maybe a trivial example, but that is a, in I've left off a lot of quick of semicolons, so and I I needed help. So if I'd had that, I would have been yeah. uh, less frustrated an awful lot of times. Computers don't and brackets either. as well. If I remember rightly, you're a big um, Lisp head. Oh yes, oh I love Lisp. If I could write in Lisp all day, I would be a very happy person. That's a particularly abstract programming language that um, has all kinds of potential errors like this. And if I had, I've taught myself, but if I had somebody to teach me, I would have gone so much faster and, and it would have helped mm. me in this way. And you're replicating that Cambridge model there, the one I had at Berkeley that uh, didn't work so well because um, what you're doing differently is making sure that it's very tightly tied to outcomes for the company and the needs of the group rather than just, okay, take calculus at 8 a.m. As Jim was, uh, was noting, not so much fun. Yes, I was going to make a joke about how we would differentiate ourselves doing calculus. Oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> we actually have some questions. I couldn't so integrate I want... it into the conversation. <laughs> good try. Good try. Um, we have some great questions, and I'm going to take them out of order because uh, Roland's question is kind of right on point to what we've just talked about. But Adina and Jim, I've seen yours, so, so don't worry. We're going to come to those. Um, if for any reason we run out of time, um, ask them on the forum. But uh, uh, let's get to Roland's because uh, I really think it's mm. uh, tied directly to what I was asking about. Um, what are your thoughts on pair programming for learning? Now, some people may not know what pair programming is. I, I referred to it briefly because I thought Howell was doing it. He, he's actually doing something closely related, but not quite the same. Pair programming is where two people work at one keyboard on the same problem. And so you wonder, well, how, you know, just one right type on the left and one on the right. No, typically, <laughs> what, although you can do that, that's really insane. Um, yeah, what you more typically do is um, uh, somebody types and somebody is observing and then they swap. And they do this very frequently. So there's um, two people thinking about the problem, and one is putting the input, and the other one is saying, but wait, that won't work on Thursdays or, or when there's a negative input. 
Um, so what do you think about that way of programming? It's not very popular. Um, I think it should be more popular, but, but I wonder if, do you use it? Is that a method that uh, you find helps people learn? What, what do you find help? I think it helps with the information sharing and it, it, it's limited by the, the skill set of the, the people involved um, is, is one of the limitations of pair programming. And it's also, it's also limited by the current problem being worked on. So what you don't get from that is the ability to step back and look at the entire kind of scope of a, of a technology or of a topic that could be learned and focus on something that's, that's irrelevant to what you're doing now. Um, so it's going to be relevant very soon. So you have a tight cycle time. But but it's, yes. it's going to be uh, of benefit in the in the future. So it sounds like Roland's example might be a, a a good one that we're headed in the right direction, because he says, "What if you put a Rust expert with somebody who's a novice?" Mm. And I've often found that that is effective for um, it, it doesn't give you everything because you're right, you don't get information that's outside the room. Um, but if you want to get information passing around your team very quickly, I, I find that's very effective, and and underused. Yeah. People think it's it's a waste of time. It's actually tremendously uh, productive. I'm surprised people would think it's a, a waste of time, actually, because I, I think you also get the, num the number of clients and, and, and bosses who have said, um, can't we just go twice as fast by stopping that stupid pairing thing? And you say, mm. wait a minute. No, that's not how it works. They're working together. They're solving the problem. It's amazing how many people make that mistake. Mm. So if it's about teaching the, the the problem with that is how does the Rust expert become more expert? Because yes. Again, I'm it gonna, only helps I one think direction. It, yeah. everyone has something still to learn. And I think it's important not just to kind of bring juniors up to speed, but also for experts to feel like they are growing and becoming deeper in their expertise. Um, and, and the place I've used it for that is um, where you get an expert in one area working with an expert in another on a common problem. So you get somebody who knows the oh, database very well and a front end engineer and they work together and then they each learn something about the other. Oh, I didn't realize that when I present the data this way, um, you show it that way. Well, that's not going to work in this case. We should fix that. And then you do generate new um, information, new skills. Mm. Um, you're still limited to what your team knows. So I, I like what you do, Hal, because you, you bring new ideas from the outside and, and you get the similar fast cycle time of the person working uh, on the immediate problem, um, but also bringing those new ideas that can say, hey, wait a minute, we just did two of these. These aren't relevant to you. You could do this a completely different way so you wouldn't have to do any of this at all. Why don't you mm. try doing that? Let's, do, let's move to that. Um, did, we also did, had did, a... a customer who wanted to do a case study because they were they were planning on bringing in external expertise to help their their juniors learn uh, it was react native um and they had estimated a budget for that and then they used a deep coaching approach to do the same thing and they think it was six times cheaper and more effective they didn't measure the more effective part but they got the outcome they wanted at six times less than they were they were expecting to with outsourcing um, very nice so yeah, and I, I think pair, pair programming works. I think it helps for, I, I would use it more for reducing bugs and getting like individual bits of code to a higher quality. I think you can get learning from it, but I think it's, it's limited by lots of, lots of things. It's also the case that not every Rust expert is great at explaining why so they're true. doing what they're doing. And, and not Coaching everyone likes skill. pairing either. Yeah, exactly. Not everyone likes pairing. They may be really great at doing it, but explaining it may not be your skill. Whereas if you t t talk to Howell, for example, or find yourself a great individual coach, that's somebody who's kind of chosen that path, who, who, who becomes mm. good at that. I want to ask you about that. We got even more great questions. Jim and Dedina, I'm going to get to yours. I really promise I'm going to try. Um, but Andrew's asked one again that is, is right on point here. And it's too long to put on the screen, but he asks, how does this method of learning change with a remote team? You might have noticed we had a pandemic, and a lot of us are on screens like this. Um, so it can be challenged when you're not in person. You might have a challenge with deep coaching when it's not in person. How how do you uh, navigate that? Uh, we've been doing it remotely since the end of 2018, actually. So I, I remember a session. This this was a real as we were sort of developing the ideas behind our our model. We had um, I turned up to do a session, and it was just before Christmas, and some of the team had gone home, which included uh, someone had gone to Argentina, someone had gone to Scotland, someone had gone to I think someone was in Pakistan for it actually, um, and we had them join remotely, and uh, they said it was as good as if they were in the room, and so I that was the point where we stopped doing anything. In, in person because we're also a fully distributed company and the deep coaching model works in a distributed way um 
because what do you do to make it work? What, how, how do you overcome the fact that somebody's in Argentina, maybe with a, a poor connection, they aren't on the screen? So what what you need for pair programming is visibility of the code, right? And the ability to have a conversation. And so people who pair program sometimes in the same office will share screen with each other uh, and have a kind of you know, video call going on, or even just a voice call. Yeah. Going Sitting on. across the desk, but uh, have it on video. Yeah, that's going to be very right. effective for pairing. How about for your deep coaching model? So we have a, an interface which has video conferencing built in. And when people are solving the problems in code, as part of the, the repo of code, they clone for the, with the exercises for any given topic they're learning. Um, they run a script which syncs the exercise files to our backend, so they're immediately visible to the coach. So what happens is you you're solving a problem in a in a learning session and you save a file it gets run automatically and you see results in the terminal but it also becomes visible to the coach immediately so they can see ah i see that you you know um squirrel and jeffrey you've made the same mistake here you've both left off that closing right bracket on the on line 47 um but add that right, in in your code let's review perfect. again why we need that and let's fix it that makes sense and and so if anybody didn't follow the more technical bits of that what they're what you're doing is is what Howell said at the end here you're, you're sharing what you're doing in the in the moment and instead of the the um uh the instructor the the expert having to do what i did back at berkeley which is to walk around and watch everybody doing it and they'll look at their paper and say oh you've integrated this incorrectly that the, you see it immediately on the screen. So there's actually a benefit, mm -hmm. I think you're saying, Howell, to having it uh, a computer in the in the as an intermediary, because it gives you greater immediacy, more chance to see. Ah, they're all making this mistake. Hey, folks, I didn't explain this well enough. Remember, you have to do it this way. If I got it right. right. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's you. You can look over their shoulder without looking over their shoulder. I suppose is is a way of saying it. Because I, one of the things I find with pairing, like sometimes you know when you're waiting for code to compile, you just like, oh, I've just I've checked my emails. I'll look on Facebook or whatever. Um, I realize not not everyone has to wait for their code to compile, but this has been part of my life in the past. And having someone sitting next to you is is kind of awkward. Like when you like just want that moment of like downtime without losing your kind of focus and um, it's one of the hard flow. things about pairing is you actually have to take very frequent breaks it's exhausting because if you try mm. to be up the whole time and you don't stop for something it's very um it, 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 you go home extre extremely tired um yeah. we have even more great questions jim come in, has come in with another one i'm going to do this one and then i might go back to your previous one jim um uh, jim says uh, i've had teams who have used rigorous code review as a way to spread expertise didn't pair for the initial implementation, went through the review notes in person. Um, it's hard to hit the sweet spot of productivity, uh, but he wasn't measuring at the time. What, what do we think? So how, what, what do you think about this kind of um, code review model where you've got people in pairs looking at the code after the fact? I think code review is definitely a way that, that people learn. And if you think about it, I think that's generally how we expect people learn, to learn. In software roles, often, the model is that we put you in a job and two or three years later, you've learned enough that we give you a promotion and your job title changes slightly. And I think most of that learning has come through code review, um, possibly through pairing if you use use pairing. Yeah, but it's an apprenticeship comes... model. You, you kind of apprentice mm. to learn the code, to learn all the tricks, to watch the experts. And then and when you can um, you know, paint or, or, or chop or whatever it is to write the code the same way, then you become a, a journeyman. The problem is yes. it takes so long to do it, and uh, you learn a lot of irrelevant stuff. So my worry is that on the model Jim's describing, you're, you're going to get a lot of exchange of information, but it's all going to be with a slow cycle time. It's going to be late in the process. It, is, it happens after the fact. And again, it's, it's about what the reviewer or sometimes reviewers know and sometimes prefer. So they might have a suggestion for a different way of doing things, but there might be a third way of doing that that you haven't come across or your way might actually be better but they have a, a certain preference for doing it another way you you don't get that sort of stepping back and and i think you you don't get as you said the cycle time or the speed there you go and and jim's other question which i've now gone back to um it really uh, plays into that really well um again you're asking these great long questions folks which is fine but i just can't put them on the screen so let me read it out and correct me if i summarize incorrectly but jim you asked um you, you can't really prioritize business tasks against a capability that the business doesn't have in other words if the people don't know that it's possible to do something we've been saying this throughout 
they, they won't prioritize it. They won't try to learn it. The experts won't um, bring it out in the code review or the pair programming. Um, so the, Jim asks a really provocative question. He says, uh, how do you make more than tiny incremental steps to expand capability? And he cites data science where um, some folks might not know this. We've had this absolute explosion in um, both visual and textual applications of uh, artificial intelligence. Literally in, in weeks or months, we have completely new capabilities that, you know, I was doing due diligence on stuff I'd never, ever heard of um, uh, just last month um, because it had been invented in the middle of the year and there were startups doing it already. <laughs> so how do you move that fast? How do you get that much information into people quickly when when uh, the, the state of the art is changing so quickly? Yeah, well, I think the, the vast majority of people involved in the state of the art are sorry, involved in data science and not doing the state of the art. But I, I mean, the core of this question is about is about learning new things. Like I think all learning has to be incremental. It's necessarily incremental if you want it to be real. I don't think we're good at learning a lot of information or a lot of skills at once. Like I loved the matrix and part of my thinking- I was just thinking of that. Company. I was thinking, yeah, you put the little chip in your brain, suddenly you can do Kung Fu. It's, I know Kung Fu. Yeah, I yeah. love that moment, but it's it's- it's not real. And I mean, it was definitely one of the kind of inspiring things I on my kind of mental mood board when when starting Skill a Whale. Um, so the, the point here was was you can't prioritize business tasks. You can you really learn a new thing fully from scratch? And I think the answer is yes. So if you're going to do some data science, firstly, you're going to need to know some Python, almost certainly or some R, maybe some MATLAB or some Java, but like you're going to need to know a programming language. And that's the thing that you need to learn. And then your data science approach is going to start by learning about data normalization or IO or the idea or the kind of concept of ETL, um, like extract the information, transforming it, loading it somewhere else. Um, and you're going to need to know about those things. The data science, the machine learning is all accretive, I want to say, like incremental improvements on top of that. The knowing how to create a, a neural network and how to run back, back propagation on it to like learn the values for the neurons and when it's sensible to use a convolutional layer and when it's, it doesn't make sense to and you're just creating unnecessary complication. All of that is is incremental learning. I think we we often see things as like very big blocks and when you're inside the block, it's actually like lots and lots of small, small steps that people need to learn. So when it comes to prioritizing business tasks against a capability doesn't a, a capability the business doesn't have, which was part of Jim's question, um, the business might not have uh, tasks against the capability it doesn't have, but it might have a strategy. It might be that in the next year we want to build a data science department, and our kind of measure of success is going to be that we have some kind of recommendation system which leads to one percent of our sales by the end of the, the year that would be um, a great model and, if, if only my clients came to me with that right that we have to move yes. quite a lot to get there it would be great if we started there okay i suspect you hear a lot of we need ai and maybe yeah. it could be on the blockchain <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> not infrequent yeah so we you can get there by taking your existing python developers who are excited about data science and uh, working out which bits of that they already know and don't and teaching them how to use pandas and numpy and one of the nice things about data science as an example is it's all become libraries like i i don't know i maybe you've had to implement these algorithms girl. i did back in the day as a student you you could just pull things off the shelf like uh and then you wanted to use it's a different Lego language all the way down these days yeah exactly and and that's a wonderful thing right because it means that it's so much easier to to uh, build data science into what we do. But, but the now problem it's is become... a lot of the wisdom is missing because you're just plugging bits together. So you haven't right. gone through the incremental process to, to actually build up the knowledge of what it does. And so you're slamming bits together. We see this in, in, in crypto, for example, where people start slamming bits together and saying, well, this will solve this problem, but nobody really, it's, it's the underpants model again, right? Question yes. mark, how it actually it works. Exactly what I was going to say, because I think a few years ago, everyone doing AI or machine learning, really what they were doing was a deep neural network. And there's actually like a much richer tapestry of ideas out there that you can use. But if you if you start with kind of, I am, I am going to be an AI, then you will learn TensorFlow and then you'll go and put it in place. But if on the other hand, you start with, 
we need to solve our problems and we think it might be some kind of something like these you can tailor the skills of your team to so that people do know about random forests or variational um, bayesian techniques or, or, or whatever things that it aren't is, fashionable but... right now yep exactly and also teach them the tools to use it and so uh, i hope that answers your question jim i feel like i've rambled a lot but essentially i think all learning is incremental and if you take the approach of taking your team and turning them into the ai software developers that you want them to be you can make sure they know the right bits with the principles that um go along with them and and i'll just add one thing to that can't argue with a bit of it uh the the um cycle time which you referred to before howell is the vital thing for me when i see a team you know i just uh, got a, a team and actually one of the people is here in the chat who's who's been making this happen this team suddenly shifted from oh we'll get this done next year to we're going to get it done next week and they've just been you know taking off and inventing new things trying stuff failing and then recovering and succeeding and that's so great to see because it accelerates the learning so much. The cycle time becomes fast. And every step is incremental. Oh, we didn't know we could release this way. Oh, we didn't know that there was this tool that we could be accused. Oh, there was this library over here. Um, and they add those bits over and over again. And if you can do that every day instead of every month or every year, you, you can actually produce a large block of knowledge very quickly by building up a brick at a time, but very fast. Mm. Yes. Definitely. As with everything else, right? It's it's build, measure, iterate all the way down. There you go. comes to skills, software. Sorry, over to you, Scarlett. Sorry, I was just going to try to squeeze in one more question before we're done. And that is from Mike, who says, um, some people aren't amazing at explaining why they're doing what they're doing. We mentioned the the, the Rust person who might be a super wizard, but um, can't tell you how to do it or, or help you. Uh, so how do you upskill people to teach their colleagues? How well, you must be doing this all the time because you bring in these expert coaches. How, how do you do it? We, well, we, we're lucky. We find the coaches who are active software developers who we think are good at good at coaching and fit to our model. Um, so I, I think improving people's abilities at coaching is hard, like coaching the coaches is difficult. I think you, you need to provide principles and structure and the opportunity to practice. Um, as with any skill, if you want someone to get better, you need to let them try, fail, give them feedback and let them try again. Um, and so I think that's the same. That's the same with being a coach. Let them teach you something. And then at the end say, actually, you talked a lot of that. And I had questions in the, the first bit and I really needed those answered for the second bit to make sense. So part of it is this. And maybe the way that you talk, I found really hard to, to listen to. Could you talk a bit slower? Um, do you, do, you or... do training sessions for your coaches? Do you, do you put them through this kind of activity to give them this feedback? We give them, we do give them a lot of feedback. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's a kind of permanent uh, feedback system. Um, not just when they come on, but um, every, every session. So we, we have a, an average rating from our learners of about 4.75 out of five at the moment. And so if we, if a, if a coach is kind of deviating from that we would we would intervene if we get any any feedback on any aspect of a session that was uh three out of five or below we would aim to do something about it which might just be talk to the coach and understand what had happened in the session there were some unusual circumstances or it might be it seems that learners are finding you talk too fast or the tangents you go on are too are too kind of wild and disconnected and they're kind of interesting but they take people away from learning um and you know, give people that that feedback and help them improve. But we are lucky in that because we select coaches for that passion and that ability, um, they come we, to you we pre, already pre, have people pre prepared already. Whereas, um, yes, in Roland's case, or, or um, Mike's, I mean, it was Mike who was asking where Mike might say, oh, "I need to help somebody learn it," and he's going to need that right. same incremental cycle time, except for the person teaching others. Okay, makes it's sense. Reminded me of your story about bring your own egg that I remember you sharing. Before. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so uh, we, the, we get people who are the, the ready-made cake mix and we just bring our own egg and they're, they're great coaches already. There you go. Fantastic. All right. Um, well, how we've got uh, more questions. There's a fantastic um, exchange going between Roland and Jim, uh, which we haven't time to go into. And, and Roland's written an essay here. I don't think it even fits on my screen. So great that you guys are discussing this. We, we do this on the forum, by the way. So um, if you guys want to carry that on, do it here by all means. Um, but you may also... Um, oh, and uh, Jim, you were, you were out for a bit. Okay, but you got your answer. Good stuff. Um, so please carry on that kind of discussion at uh, and uh, on the forum uh, because that's when everybody learns. 
and uh, uh, this has been such a great learning experience here. Talk about short cycle time. Um, you know, I found out a lot more about what you do, how how it works. Um, it, it's exciting. Um, so uh, what I want to do uh, first, of course, is make sure we uh, mention Howell and uh, different ways to find him. So the first is uh, Skiller Whale, uh, uh, the project we've been talking about, uh, uh, Howell's uh, pride and joy. Uh, so if you're interested in talking to Howell about how he does this, about um, uh, uh, getting him in to help you with this kind of deep coaching, uh, there on the screen, uh, SkillerWhale.com is the place. How, how else can people find you, talk to you, um, interact with you? Uh, well, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. My name is a, it seems to be globally unique and historically unique. So if you search for Howell Carver, that will be me. Whatever past crimes I've committed, you'll find those too. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I am on um, a now defunct social networking site called Twitter, but I'm also on Mastodon. Uh, I can't remember where I am on Mastodon. I need to, I think I'm like Howell at tuknooks.social. You're linked on LinkedIn. So we'll, we'll tell people to start yeah. with LinkedIn. <laughs> How about your podcast and, and, uh, and your CTO group? Yes. So um, we have a, a podcast called Primarily Context Based, where we take questions for focused on tech leaders. So we don't, we don't, uh, bring in the non-tech leaders as much as, as you do, Squirrel. But there is some something in there for non-tech leaders as well, I think. Uh, and we're focused on the kind of contextual, difficult questions that, that leaders face. So that's primarily context-based. Um, and then I have, until until there was a pandemic, I ran a dinner club for CTOs called CTO Dinners, uh, which you can find at, I think you sign up at TLD, which used to stand for Tech Leader Dinners, and I really need to rebrand it. TLD. If, if people get in touch with you on, on LinkedIn, can they find it there? They absolutely can, and you can message me there as well, and I will happily reply and send the right Fantastic. link. Rather than me try to type it, and I'll probably get it wrong. Let's let's let people get in touch with you there. But um, Howell runs amazing dinners, um, good food, and um, fantastic uh, conversation among the CTOs, which is uh, very valuable. Uh, I wish there were more of these for uh, peer learning of that kind. Fantastic stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, if you'd like to get uh, recordings, uh, if you want to discuss this further, uh, if you want to uh, just be part of the, the squadron and come to uh, events like this uh, every single week, uh, see me in person. Um, uh, we have a, a knowledge base with uh, tons and tons of information. I'm, I'm sure your podcast is on there, Hal, um, but we have hundreds of different um, podcasts and articles and uh, blogs and, and other places where you can learn. Um, uh, the Squirrel Squadron is the place to do that. So uh, get in touch uh, there and uh, sign up and, and be part of it. Howell, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone for fantastic questions. As we always get, um, that's the most fun part uh, is answering your questions. Uh, I'll see you next week uh, um, at the PyData conference. Thanks, Howell. Thanks, Gerald. And thank you, everyone, in the comments. I really appreciate it.